In the last video we covered some of the basics of what a buffer overflow is and how to exploit it. We introduced some of the tools that we'll be using throughout this series like Geardra and Pwn Debug. And then we looked at a very basic buffer overflow example where we simply overflowed the buffer to crash the program. So this time we're going to look at something a little more interesting which is overwriting local variables on the stack. And there's a different goal here. So in our previous example we caused the program to crash. Now you can imagine if that was a web server or some kind of application that doesn't automatically restart that we're actually causing a denial of service but we're not actually doing anything particularly interesting we're not changing anything in the program we're not redirecting the execution and we're certainly not executing any malicious code so again this is quite an easy example we're going to step away up as we go through and hopefully learn something new each time so let's go and take a look at the file that we have this time around we've got a login file and login.c which we use to compile it I'm actually going to compile it again let me copy the command we went through this in a previous video, but whenever we're compiling these, we can specify that we don't want any protections enabled, so this will prevent it from adding canaries to the stack. The dash z exec stack will make sure that the stack is marked as executable. And no pi means that the program will load at the same memory address each time. And then we're just specifying 32-bit. So if we go and have a look at the file type now, we'll see as we should know because we just compiled it, it's a 32-bit LSB executable. It's dynamically linked, which as we mentioned last time, that means that rather than including all of the code for functions from libc and things like that, it'll simply reach out to the libc library on your computer system and find out the addresses of those functions. We can also see it's not stripped, so it makes it a little bit easy to debug. We'll be able to look through the function names and things like that. Another initial file check we should do is run checksec to see what protections are enabled. Again, we know what those protections are because we specifically specified them when we compiled this binary. But quite often if you're working on a binary from a CTF or if you're trying to exploit a real binary, an application, you won't have access to the source code. So you'll just have the binary and you'll need to go and have a look to see what protections have been set. And just to relate these back to what we specified so that no canary found is because we specified f no stack protector. The nx disabled is because we specified dash z exec stack. And the pi, no pi, is because we said no pi here. And then of course 32-bit because we specified dash m32. So uh, again, I'll go through these in more detail as we approach them because at some point we're going to start enabling these protections. And then we're going to see how it changes things and how we can bypass those, those protections. But it's very good to build up a methodology anyway to have a process that you follow each time you come across one of these binaries. So if we're repeating using these tools in every video, it's because we should be using them regularly. All right, so now let's have a look at the actual file. Let's try and run it and see what happens. I'm gonna do this before we look at the code because as I say, quite often you won't have access to that code and you need to know how to fuzz for a buffer overflow without it. So in this case, it's asked for a password. We could just try and put in a password. Let's say, hello. And we get incorrect password, failed to log in as admin, authorized equals zero. So one thing we could actually do here would be to try and use something like ltrace or if it was a remote server, we could use strace. And if we pass in login, see what it's asking for. It's asking for the admin password. Let's put in test. And you'll see actually there's a string compare here where it's comparing test to pass. So even without access to the source code, we were able to determine quite easily with ltrace, and you could do this with a debugger as well, or a disassembler, that what's happening whenever we enter in a password is it's being compared to the word pass. Which means, of course, we can run this again and type in pass and we get the correct password, and now authorized is one instead of zero. Now let's assume that the developers were a little more careful and that you couldn't quite easily determine the password just by looking at the disassembly or by tracing it with ltrace. And let's try to overflow the buffer. So we don't know how many bytes have been declared for this password field. So we might just wanna try and enter in a lot of bytes to see what we get. And you see that we get segmentation fault and we get this really large authorized number. So we know that whenever we entered pass, which is the correct password, we didn't get any problems there. When we entered hello, we didn't get any problems. So let's try six characters instead. One, two, three, four, five, six. We failed to log in because we put in the incorrect password. Let's try seven. And this time we successfully logged in and authorized is set to 97, which is the decimal value of the ASCII character A. So if we do that again with Bs, you'll see it's now 98. 
So that's the reason that's happened. So we'll go and review the source code and try to see exactly what was happening whenever we exploited that. So I'm going to open this up in Codium, login.c, and this was the C code that we compiled. And we've got a main function here. There's only a main function. It declares this buffer, which is a password variable with six, uh, six chars. And then we have int authorized equals zero. It asks us for a password. It calls gets, which is that dangerous function, which isn't making sure that whatever we're entering is going to fit into this six byte char array. And then it's going to compare what we entered to pass, string compare. So if it's correct, it sets authorized to one. If not, it says incorrect password. And then at the bottom, we have a check just to see was authorized set to one, because the only time authorized should be set to one is if the correct password was entered. But because we have the password array here, and then we have authorized right after it there on a stack, if we overflow this the six byte buffer, guess what's going to be overwritten first? And that's exactly what we saw happening. Now, in this case, this check is simply checking to see whether if authorized, so if that's not a zero, it's going to come back basically true. But in the next video, we'll look at a slightly more complex example of overwriting local variables on the stack, where we'll actually have to specifically write in a value in order to meet the check. We won't just be able to overflow with any old value. And that's the source code. Very simple. Let's go and have a look at this in Geardra. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that Geardra auto script that I mentioned in the last video and put a link to. And this will mean that I don't have to go through that whole process of setting up a project and auto analyze, uh, setting the analysis and stuff like that, importing the file. It takes, uh, it takes a minute or so. And this will basically go through and do all of that for us. So we just leave it for maybe 10, 20 seconds. You can see it's imported it. So I can just straight away double click on it and it's already analyzed as well. So I don't need to click on analyze again. I'm going to go straight into the functions here, straight down to our main function. And I just want to look and see what we've got compared to the C code that we were looking at previously. So you can see, obviously, we don't have the variable names. But we've got all the same variables. We can see this is our six byte password array. So we might want to go and set that to equal pass. And we could go ahead and let's say this one is authorized as well. And I'm just, I'm just typing the lowercase l whenever I click on that to bring up the option to change the name or you can go into right click and rename variable. And that's the code, so it's pretty much the same as what we saw. We could go through and we could actually go through line by line and see what this matches to in the assembly code. So for example, down here, we can see that we have a comparison right here. So we've got this compare instruction where you can see it's comparing the authorized variable to zero, which is exactly what we see here. And then we have a jump zero. So it's basically saying if you compare these and it's a zero, if they match, then jump down to this next point where we can double click that and see it's down here. Otherwise, it'll just continue with the code that's in this part of the assembly. We'll step through this with a debugger as well, just to try and get a better idea of what's happening. But you don't need to be an expert in the assembly code to get a general idea of what's going on. As long as you understand that we have these conditional statements like jump zero and jump not equals and things like that, that can go quite a long way when it comes to exploiting basic buffer overflows. Okay, so let's go and check this out with GDB Pwn Debug, which we used in the previous video as well. Just trying to get a feel of these tools. So if you've never used these before, hopefully going through the same sort of steps a few times will get you used to it before we get onto the more complex challenges. So we've run GDB Pwn Debug with the login. We can have a look with info functions to see what functions we have here. Again, we can disassemble functions. So we can say disassemble main. And this gives us the same assembly code that we're seeing in Geardra. And again, we can go and look through this. We can see that we have that compare instruction right here, which was comparing zero to the item we have on the stack, which is the authorized variable. We can't quite see that here, like we can see here where it actually has the authorized variable mentioned here, although we did rename it as well. But we could also set a breakpoint up here. So we can either say we want to break at this address. You can do break star and then the address or we can do break star and you can see this is at main plus 140 so we could do main plus 140 that sets up the breakpoint so every time it hits that instruction this line it's gonna break and then ask us what we want to do next so let's try and run the program it asks us for the password we'll say test and we've hit this breakpoint so you can see this is the line that's currently being executed 
and it's going to check to see if what's in EBP minus 0xc, which is 12 in decimal, equals 0. And then based on whether it does or not, it's going to say if they equal, jump to main plus 169. Otherwise, it'll just continue with this code that we have here. So let's go ahead and print out that value. We can say x and then dollar to represent that register EAX. Oh, sorry, it was EBP and minus 0xc. We print that and it's, a ze it's all zeros. So we could actually modify this because we're in the debugger. But one thing to mention is we can see that actually the value is zero, but the value is at this address. So rather than saying set EBP minus 0xc equals one, for example, we would actually want to set this address to that value. So we can say equals one and then try to print that again. And this time we have one, which means of course, if we hit continue, we're gonna get successfully authorized, even though we didn't put in the correct password. So this is why it's important that whenever CTF challenges are created and stuff like that for Pwn, that there's always a remote server to exploit because if you just have a local binary that people need to overflow the buffer, they'll just connect a debugger and step through it and try to manipulate values to get the flag out. All right, let's try again with another example. So we'll run the program and let's try and put in some A's. We'll do the seven A's again. We hit our breakpoint. Let's go back up to that value. This time it's 61, which we know is the ASCII value for the A. 61 in hex, that is. If we wanted to represent that as a decimal, we can just do, I think just P. Oh. P over I, no, okay, it's been a while since I used GDB. Let me bring over a cheat sheet here. So there's various ways that you can represent variables. You saw that I was using X there to represent things in hex, but we can see that we can also do some of the things here. So we can represent as chars, we can use larger amounts of data. So for example, we could do X over four X. Let's do EBP, for example, and that's gonna show us the four separate values. So you can go through this. I'm not an expert with GDB. I know about as much as I need to get things done a little bit more all the time. And just to say, I haven't really mentioned, but you know, I'm not an expert in any of this stuff. This is all stuff that I've learned mostly over the past couple of years. And if I get things wrong, let me know in the comments. There are certainly people who are better at binary, binary exploitation and pwn than I am. Okay, so we've had a quick look at GDB again anyway. What I'm gonna do now is just show a pwn tools script. So. Let me open up the exploit.py. This is the most basic Pwn tool script. I just wanted to show this because we're gonna start doing more complex scripts as we go. And I actually have a template which I use which has quite a lot of boilerplate code in it to do different things. But I don't wanna confuse you with all that yet. So here's a very basic program. We import the Pwn library. We start the process, which is the login. This could also be remote and have a server address and a port number. In this case, we're just doing it locally. And we're waiting for this colon. So if we run the program again, let's run login. It says enter admin password. And we're just saying after that last colon, that's the last thing that it'll see, we want you to send, and in this case, I'm sending seven capital A's. We then just receive the output and print it to the screen. So let's try and run it. Python exploit. It runs and just exactly the same as we saw. We've just made a script to automate it. This isn't really important at the moment, but if you think about a more complex buffer overflow, whereby you have a series of different options, inputs and outputs where you need to send and receive data, you can't just copy and paste values because at some point we're gonna be using memory addresses, things in hex which aren't gonna print out characters which we can copy and paste because they're not gonna be in the ASCII range. So we'll see more complex examples as we go. I just want to show a very, very basic Pwn script just to mention as well, the Pwn Tools template that I have, which is all over my GitHub, and you can just kind of take any challenge example, but you can just type Pwn template, I believe, and this gives you a rough template. I've, I've changed mine a bit, so I've added some additional functionality to it and changed some of the comments and stuff around and just put in some code that helps me more whenever I'm doing these exploits. But that's that. That's our first look at overwriting variables on the stack using a buffer overflow.
local variables and in our next video we'll look at a slightly more complex example where we need to specify a specific value. We can't just overwrite the authorized variable with anything in order to bypass the login. And I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. Thanks.